yeah, some of you may have seen a screen from this talk we're going to take a peep at. But I doubt many of you have seen the talk itself in full or in part. We will not be watching this movie. I've never seen it, by the way. I've never seen it. I'm going to be, uh, I've seen many clips from it, never watched it. Never watched it. So I'm going to be at a disadvantage observing this. You haven't? No, I've wa I don't watch movies. I, well, I, I very, very, very rarely watch movies. I don't watch TV. And the, the only reason I've watched any TV or watch movies is because I watch them with my girlfriend. I would never, ever choose to otherwise. For me, it's just spending time with my girlfriend and there's a movie or a show on. Like, I would never, ever choose to watch something. This is the talk from the Game Devs of Color Expo, from which you may have seen a screenshot circulating. It has an SBI uh, employee, contractor, whatever the hell they are, with a, with a screen, a PowerPoint slide behind them saying, I'm here to destroy the games industry! Ah! So maybe you've seen that around. This is the context. We're going to take a peep. We'll see if it's interesting. Uh, Rags, the dog was saying that this is a demented individual. The little clip I spoiled for myself would suggest that this assessment is accurate. So, let's see. How old did her feet look? Whose feet? What are we talking about? How to get away with murder. Subverting genre expectations with Cameron Wilde. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to uh, attend or watch this talk. Um, how to get away with you're welcome. You're welcome. Sweat booby. Murder subverting genre expectations. My name is Cameron Wilde, and I'm a narrative designer uh, and sensitivity reader with a company called Sweet Baby Inc., mm. based out of so called Montreal. These are some of my. Focus on inclusion and creating joy through storytelling. I took a very long scenic route to my current role. I believe the stories we tell each other are more than entertainment. Sometimes, depends on the story. Depends on the uh, perspective of the person observing the story as well. Things that are intended to be uh, didactic can be taken in a way such that the didactic properties are destroyed. Stories that were not meant to be didactic can be interpreted in such a way that they become as such and teach a lesson. Baby Inc. based out of so-called Montreal. These are some of my um, co-workers. Uh, we specialize in narrative development. It's the AIDS Ausrad face again. Top middle, top middle, there it is. Which means working with teams on everything from script writing to narrative direction, casting. What do you mean? Look at Ausrad right now. It's, it's his Twitch avatar. Click on his account. Uh, to cultural consultation. And we do it with a focus on inclusion, but also on creating joy through storytelling. Um, That's a huge red flag, by the way. We have a focus on creating joy. Hello, we're an uh, entertainment consultancy. We focus on creating joy. That's like saying, my business is about making things good. Um, so as for my own story, uh, I took a really long and scenic route to my current role. I studied acting, I worked at the National Film Board of Canada, I toiled in data mines at a Ooh. giant software company, and I even did two tours. Of Film Board of Canada. At film school, which is two more times than I would recommend anyone attend. But sometimes you only know you've made a mistake until uh, after it's happened, and sometimes you only know once you've made it twice. Um, but all of that- um, You don't know until after, not you've only, you only know until after. Just that saying- That taught me a lot about how to structure your story, what makes the story engaging, and maybe more importantly, how not to structure I did the engaging things, therefore my story is engaging. Stories, which isn't to say that you ever really learn anything, but it's been helpful as I've started to really navigate through the games industry. I feel like this is uh, a red flag, actually. This is a red flag, actually. So uh, my, my girlfriend is an, is an artiste. Don't want to dox, so I won't go into too much detail. While there is process, it seems very much the value of a good creative is in their taste. Not just they know the right things. And if someone's going, I learned the right things, and they're not going to say anything about taste or give examples of their own successes, they're probably a fraud. Uh, because the stories we tell each other are way more than entertainment. 
there, how we create, debate, and preserve our collective values and beliefs. And we can and should make better, more expansive, more representational. Better. What does better here mean? Having said that the stories represent our collective beliefs, presumably a better story is a more moral story. Right? What is better in the context of stories when you believe their purpose is to preserve values and represent group values? Who was it who said didacticism is the death of art? Content. So, cool, but why am I here? Well, I'm here because we're all game devs. Game devs of... <laughs> so this slide spread around Twitter, and people were saying, when people tell you what they are, believe them! Look! The evil sweet babyoid says they're burning the games industry to the ground. That's their goal. Ah! Ah! You're a f***ing autistic retard. They would be based if that's what they're doing. It's not. They wish to be leeches. Of course they don't want to burn it to the ground. This is them making fun of you. This is not mask off. This is you being made fun of. Okay? Just... Sometimes you need a helping hand, Twitter people. Cooler story is a safer world. I'll let this person talk for a minute color even. And I think a lot of us, given our shared experiences, have seen how limited in scope and imagination entertainment can be. Sure. I'll just straight out give you that. Obviously, a big part of that is just the reality of working in a creative system that prioritizes capital over telling stories that truly entertain, enrich, and benefit people. That truly entertain. That's an interesting qualifier. That truly entertain. I mean... Prioritizing capital, you want to put out that will consistently entertain. I'd, I'd say the the primary goal would be entertainment there. Yeah. The sh you want to do getting away from that would be stuff that necessarily isn't just entertaining, but more meaningful. And you're gonna, you're gonna gatekeep a lot of people out of it, because you can only derive meaning from a work. Uh, how, how do I explain this? relative to the library of meaning you already have in your in your head your own dictionary of culture hard capture ability to derive things from from creative works if you're looking to if you're looking to hit it out of the park every time you're going to stick within their library make sure what you put out is understandable and accessible to everyone going away from that necessarily means making something that isn't for everyone i don't think you can package that as truly entertaining I'll let them talk. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm off mark in what they're saying. But beyond that, there's also a large extent to which many of the people seeking to tell stories in games simply don't know how, which is fine. Uh, that's I'd say that's not fine. That's an embarrassment. That's like the loser kid who wants to, I'm going to be a famous musician. Okay, show me your music. I uh, don't know how. Learn. Try it. Do it. Someone who likes the idea of being a storyteller or writing stories? You're set, you're telling me you want to empower posers! No, don't do that! Huge mistake! If you Do that if you want horrendous, vapid shit where people are gonna paint by numbers based on the template you've given them. Nah! F those people! That's why we at Sweet Baby do what we do. Uh, but we hit a wall sometimes when it's not just that creatives don't know how to tell a story well, it's that they want to tell a certain story, and a certain story that often they're unequipped to tell. That point, we've seen happen a million times. I mean, just look at Dustborn. <laughs> and when I say- I don't think anyone could help them though. I don't think anyone could help that. They are unequipped to tell. I don't mean in terms of resourcing. I mean, creative people or teams who want to tell a story, they don't have the identity perspective experience or empathy to tell. Oh, it's a racial politics point. They're not, not equipped because they're an unskilled storyteller. They're unequipped because of the color of their skin. Counterpoint to this suggestion. If you fake an ethnic identity, other ethnic people will believe you're authentic and say that they can feel that coming through. It has happened multiple times in particular with people pretending to be East Asian and then getting accolades for being so authentic. And then when they find out the person's, their person's white, they're like, I knew all along, I could tell. This is fake, this isn't real, um, and this is some weird, like, tribal stuff. If you want ethnic gatekeepers to accept your story, just take a fake, like, black pen name. You don't have to hire a sweet baby, you just have to pretend to be black, and then they'll think it's authentic. You just have to convince them you are- It's- it- because- 
what you're doing is pandering to racists. You just have to convince them you are that race. There's nothing you can actually do with the story to make it authentic. It doesn't matter. They're not actually checking for that. They're just checking that the right skin colored person worked on it. So you can just pretend to be that yourself. And who don't want to feel the discomfort that arises when they realize they've reached the limits of their abilities. I'm sure you've met many. People who are uncomfortable being told that not every story is theirs to own. And I can sympathize. Uh, any of us can sympathize with the experience of being uncomfortable or afraid. But I can't say- Sorry, is this a- Is this person a narrative realist? Does this the person think that stories are things that exist outside of being created? And that you're like pulling them from the world? Not every story is theirs to own. It's not like you're grabbing a story and it's like, I'm grabbing this black story. No, you've made it. You, you, you made it up. If I make a black story, do I have to look? Oops, I made a story and it's black. I have to give it to the black. What, what do you mean? Sympathize with the idea that discomfort is an acceptable reason not to do better. Because a lot of us who are really fighting for more inclusive games and storytelling don't have a choice when it comes to discomfort. A lot of us who are just existing don't have a choice. Which makes us really hard often. Um, but recently I have started realizing that that discomfort or the place where whiteness doesn't have to live is where some of the best stories are told. And it's where genre storytelling lives. So I call this talk how to get away with murder, because... I would suggest this is Dementoid. Prove that space where whiteness doesn't have to live, where some of the best stories are told. When you do genre well, it's about going deep into that well of discomfort and telling a story that has teeth and pushes boundaries and allows a kind of emotional resonance. I have bad news. Your existence is defined by its contrast to whiteness. All of your stories are just nega white stories. Best just saying! It's described as visceral. And these are the kind of stories that make me feel real. Excuse me? And these are the kind of stories that make me feel real. I'm trying to understand what the hell this means. Is this... If my experiences aren't represented in some sort of canon, I'm not legit. Is this like... My identity needs the, like, Snopes fact check seal of approval for me to actually be real. Like, outsourced sense of self-identity. I don't know what that means. Kind of stories that make me feel real. You think, therefore I am. I exist only insofar as I am observed. Demented. This is, look, I'm an American, okay, I'm a US citizen. But I think it's fair to see, say that this is an extremely American disease. This is, like, the woke development of... Being on TV once can be the most important part of your life. Holy shit, television is everything, celebrity is everything. Being seen is, it's no longer just, oh, that's exciting, and like, I'm gonna go to LA and f my life up and try to be an actress. It's actually being seen like that is a human right, and we need it to feel real. Now, when I talk about genre storytelling... <laughs> like the guy who was in Wheel of Fortune once. Michael DeSisto. That's his name. What do I mean? I mean... Horror. I am seen. Thank you, Googlebot. You exist now. Sci-fi, fantasy, westerns. Can I... Every time I hear these people talk, this runs through my head. Human beings feel pleasure when they are watched. I have recorded their smiles as I tell them who they are. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that this, this, these people? I have recorded the smiles of people as I tell them who they are. I feel seen. Oh, I feel seen. This game makes me feel seen. The need to be observed and understood was once satisfied by God. Now, we can implement the same functionality with data mining algorithms. God and the gods were apparitions of observation, judgment, and punishment. Other sentiments toward them were secondary. No one will ever worship a software entity peering at them through a camera. The human organism always worships. First, it was the gods. Then, it was fame. The observation and judgment of others. Ah! <laughs> Next, it will be the self-aware systems you have built to realize truly omnipresent observation and judgment. You underestimate humankind's love of freedom. Ah! Without, that desire, <laughs> judgment. Without that desire, the cohesion of groups is impossible. And so is civilization. Hey, Tim, you see the Chinese poop explosion? I did not. Kind of thing. 
And when I'm looking at media that relies heavily on tropes, cinematic conventions, and predetermined narrative arcs. Predetermined narrative arcs. You have to explain what you mean by that. Do you mean like, it's the mono, the, mom, can I have the monomyth? We have the monomyth at home, and then it shows every story ever written. Um, or do you mean non-improvised <laughs> stories? <laughs> And I know that's kind of a fuzzy definition of a fuzzy term, but that's also the point. It's that often you don't know genre until you feel it. Right. This is very Tumblr. This is, um, no, I would, I would disagree. And as such, some of the most resonant experiences for me of seeing myself on screen and feeling really. Of seeing myself on screen. What did you act in? What, are, what games are you in? The way these people use myself is very strange. Extremely bizarre to me. Accurately perceived has been through genre. Literally me! Literally me! He just like me, for real, for real. On our cinema. For example, I don't think that I've ever had a theater going experience like the one I had when I saw Get Out. And I know it took me just like a couple of minutes to mention Get Out. I you get a lot of white people up inside you. <laughs> I haven't uh, <laughs> I haven't seen Get Out but I, I, I believe that's some element of it I think we all knew it had to happen um, I love Jordan Peele I think he is one of the only people who has made a film that has been successful with all different kinds of audiences and has also I think really faithfully represented something fundamental about racial trauma yeah there was a very uh, Fabry there was a very disturbing post I saw where someone was talking about Lollipop Chainsaw, and they posted, like, a, a young, blonde cheerleader with big tits, and they go, this obviously isn't for straight men. You're telling me this is their vibe? This is how they identify? And it's just, oh, no, you really are just broken. You, you don't distinguish between what you consume and, and your identity. It's not that just that... It's not just that consumption itself is your identity, the things you consume are your identity. That's f crazy. You value it based on how it aligns with what you wish to be or how you see yourself. That's f insane. The reason why he's able to put Chris Washington, played by Daniel Kaluuya, through so much shit and get out is because through the manip manipulation of genre, Peel signals to us that he values Chris as a character and as a representation of- He's talking to me. Jordan Peele is talking to me. Through this film, he invited me to dinner. Of a black experience. But Get Out's not my favorite film. Because I have to tell you that my favorite film is, maybe of all time, is a comedy called Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. Never seen it. We Only seen clips. Which I think often catches people off guard. And... It would also probably catch them off guard if they knew it was my parents' favorite film. Because... Moral judgment I see here. My parents grew up in the U.S. in a time when they weren't allowed to eat in diners with their white friends. But the reason I love it is that beyond some truly classic Mel Brooksian slapstick humor and fart jokes, Blazing Saddles is extremely aware of social inequality and finds its humor in that darkness. Yeah, what if the viewer isn't? Nothing you can do about that. You can't guarantee a viewer is going to look at it uh, the way you want them to, even if it's the smart way to look at it. Which means I can laugh in a way that is cathartic. It's a movie that isn't making jokes about me, but for me. And I think that's really awesome. Why are you just using a presentation to tell everyone you're a bitch? Why is that awesome? It's awesome that the jokes aren't about me! Wow, you're just a huge bitch. What, why would you say this? You couldn't get this out of me. You could, you could put like bamboo shoots growing under my fingers and I wouldn't say this. Because you can tell just in the text, uh, but it's also a fact, that Brooks worked with black writers to make sure the jokes came at the expense of whiteness and chipped away at an absurd... You can't make sure of that. You can't be sure of that. And you especially can't be sure of that over time. Social hierarchy. 
it's deliberately and unexpectedly maybe a narrative that contributes to the liberation of people like me. Contributes to your liberation. Isn't respectful. Uh, it's offensive. Yeah, but it offends the right people, which is to me the point of truly incisive, intentional genre work. I've never seen anyone say it is offensive outside of, you know, I've never seen someone be offended by it. And this is the first non-white person I've ever seen say they like it. But I haven't, I haven't watched it. So my perspective on this is limited. Which brings me back to the aim of this talk. So in my work in narrative, we're often tasked with quote unquote sensitivity reading, a term we frankly don't really love because despite its huge importance, sensitivity makes it sound like Weenie Hut Jr. treatment for your script. Is that going to be it? Sensitivity reading is also seen as, is often seen as reductive and flattening. In the most frustrating case, it's time to place your bets. Is it going to be makes it sound like it's softening all the scripts, makes it sound like it's sensitive to everyone, whereas it should be sensitive to non-whiteoids and have it be offensive to whiteoids. Is that what this is going to be? Is that what we're... I know that I, a black, non-binary person, is going to be seen as someone looking to reduce, quote-unquote, offense, basically a buzz killer. They assume that I'm going to want less violence, less discomfort, or some kind of coddled, boring, or nice story, when actually it's really the opposite. The purpose of sensitivity work is not to tell easy stories or boring stories, it's to tell stories that resonate, that fire people up and excite them, take them on journeys. It's to ensure that we tell stories that are big and loud and scary and subversive, but that we do so with authenticity. You might fantasize about this. This is not what you're used for. And your colleagues have complained that you are just used to dull things so there won't be a backlash to a product based on offense, actually. And that we get to the heart of it. This is your fantasy of what it should be. This is not what it is. Nor is it its purpose, because if it was its purpose, it would be used for that. And it's not used for that. Audience. Because ultimately, if you're telling a story that misses its audience, that doesn't ring true, or that fits... It's interesting, again, talking about the um, internalization of corporate values, the idea of something having an audience is, is like very much a, a salesperson perspective. But it's become, a, it's become sort of a social justice and moral perspective to have. This story is for this ethnic group or this cultural group, because that's moral and correct and they should have one. When realistically, that's that functions more as a as a marketing strategy, as sales to exploit them, um, but it's become it's been warped into a moral thing. Similarly to how um, the obsession with fame and being seen has gone from uh, a negative uh, marker, something that's seen as vain and disgusting and base, is now a human right to be seen. Everyone deserves to be seen fails to cut in the right direction. The problem is- Ah, uh, cut in the right direction. I win. My prediction was correct. I'll take that as a win. Thank you. That it's just insensitive. The problem is it's bad. Like a film called Django Unchained. Bad to whom? Was the director unhappy with Django? And the impact it had? So then it Tarantino seems like a, seems like a hard ass to me, sort of. I doubt he was upset with it. Take a moment to pause and offer an apology. This isn't the talk that I pitched, which isn't to say anyone should panic, but it's that when I wrote up my outline, I had a whole plan that I was going to take nope and get out and approach this by talking about horror and the ways Jordan Peele and others have really nailed it alongside a few examples of how movies like Django Unchained have fallen short. If you haven't seen Django Unchained, I guess like congratulations to you. Um, but it's about an enslaved black man. I'm the flip side. I'm the guy who hasn't seen Blazing Saddles, but has seen Django. Django is a tale of a, of a tentist, a tent, sorry, a dentist biting candy. I think that's a worthwhile little, little silliness. Whole thing, whole thing is good because of that alone. Played by Jamie Foxx, rescued from slavery by a white bounty hunter 
played by Christoph Waltz. And through the course of the film, he learns, I don't know, some stuff, I guess. And then he ostensibly gets his revenge on white supremacy or whatever, which on paper sounds like a premise that could make for maybe. Sounds like an uncreative reading. You can get more from things you are, if you are open to it, if you want to be. Some brilliant genre storytelling. And I'm sure many people, Quentin Tarantino in particular, uh, feel like it's a liberatory masterwork. But when I sat down to rewatch it, you sound salty as hell. Watch it, I realized how boring it is. And not only boring, but it's a perfect example of what not to do with genre. So they're going to start talking very strangely about genre. They've turned genre into something you feel, which is strange. I'm sorry. Uh, so, so now they're sort of saying it's a perfect example of how not to make me feel right. In a sense, it would seem. Uh, because I will talk about how to do it right. But before that, I'm going to have to talk about how Django Unchained and Quentin Tarantino in particular get it so, so wrong. Are we going to have wrong defined? Wrong in what sense? Moral sense? Like it cuts the wrong way, perhaps, or what? Because in my work, I meet a lot of Tarantinos. These are people who say, Death of the Edgelord! Let's go. Hey, I want this to be gritty, dark, or edgy. And they have this obsession with edginess. Bro! When the black critics came out with savage think pieces about Django, I couldn't have cared less. If people don't like my movies, they don't like my movies, and if they don't get it, it doesn't matter. You took that personally, you weak little bitch. And now you're salty about it, and you're using a presentation to cry about it. This is embarrassing. This is really, really, really embarrassing. What are you doing? I don't care about what black people think. It's kind of suspicious coming from a guy who gathers them to him all the time. He didn't say that. Maybe he thinks that. Maybe he said it elsewhere. Didn't say it here. He said he doesn't care about stupid, retard black critics who don't get what he was doing. Now, you can say it doesn't matter if they don't get what he was trying to do, because they may be saying he didn't do it. Right? Subjective. It's up to interpretation. They can say he fails or whatever. He's saying they're dumb and they're wrong about what he's doing, though. So. Sort of a context-free version of art is supposed to make people uncomfortable. As an auteur, Quentin Tarantino, he didn't say a context-free version of art is meant to make people feel uncomfortable. He called them dumb. He called them stupid and said they have bad taste. Is what he's saying there, dog? Tino feels like someone who grasps after edginess when they don't really have any human tragedy to explore the depths of. What's wrong with edginess? Why can't, what's wrong with edgy? That could be a thing. They don't understand that growth comes from trauma, sure, but it also comes from joy. He holds a no pain, no gain kind of mentality that I think is un You're f ill. unshakably rooted in white supremacist patriarchal values. And you got, you got wounded by that quote. You got wounded. And in that, we come to the first lesson Django teaches us about genre. If you want to be edgy, realize that it's meaningless unless you is this person alt-right? What's coming on here? I just read what's on the screen. If you are a person with power and privilege, you're only taking a risk if you're challenging the structures that gave you that power and privilege in the first place. <laughs> Kev, what do you mean by this in Hollywood? What are you suggesting? By creating Django Unchained, Tarantino has challenged nothing about himself. I don't know that I just did the I just did the lip thing. I just did the noise, but also I don't think there were many feet. I don't think there were many exposed feet in Django Unchained. That probably took a huge amount of self-control, honestly. A huge amount. And also Rev. Indeed, this is working on the assumption that there's any desire to do that or that that is good. Lesson one. Good genre starts with representation on the creative team. The foundations of the project must be solid representation on the creative team representative of what though that's another thing that gets me representative of black americans representative of of what the, the ethnicity the genes the culture one 
genre is incompatible with the death of the author. You describe genre as something that you know when you feel it. That sounds plenty compatible, but also, this f me up. This is the quote that Rags posted in the Discord. Death of the author refers more specifically to the idea that meaning of a piece is, is, you know, decided by the observer. What matters is the meaning the person who looks at it got from it. That doesn't change objective qualities or any sort of uh, assessment that relies on those objective qualities. So if you have, if you have genre, X genre is when this, this, and this, and the thing objectively has this, this, and this, then it's not a subjective thing. So this person could be saying whether something is of a certain genre or not isn't down to the observer's interpretation, or at least overwhelmingly isn't. I could agree with that, but they just said earlier that genre is more something you feel. If it's something you feel and not something that's decided by objective criteria, then what the f*** are you saying here? In Tarantino's case, the man seems to thrive on people hating him, and so I don't hate him, but... <laughs> But are you doing that because, are you saying you don't hate him because you do hate him and you don't want him to thrive by saying you hate him? You've been mind raped by Django Unchained. This should have stayed in the shower. This should not have been a presentation. You should have just been going through this yourself as you, as you rub your head in, under, the, under the hot water. He thrives on hatred, therefore I do not hate him. She said hatefully, they said hate, he, whatever, whichever one it was. I do think his work needs to be critiqued out of existence. <laughs> his work needs to be critiqued out of existence. I don't hate him, I just wish for the annihilation of his media. Right. Is there any value to this presentation? If there is, would you have made it without Django Unchained? Of course you wouldn't, you couldn't because you're referring to it. Therefore, he gets some credit for you having done this. Well, credit and that he specifically has to be addressed in any discussion of that work. Did this person just throw out genre is un incompatible with death of the author? Just to just throw that out to say, um, actually, um, you cannot interpret it without consideration of him. Without backing it up. Without explaining why that is the case. Just throw that line out there as, a, as an axiom. Because Tarantino is capable of genre filmmaking uh, the genre he's chosen with Django. That line as well is absurd. Capable of genre. Are there people who can make a film that doesn't... Are there people who don't hit the hurdle of the film they create having a genre? Is there a skill barrier to creating media that has... I have not seen genre used quite like this ever before. Black exploitation. Yeah. And why? Uh... Is Django itself a black exploitation film? It's heavily referential it's a tricky one it's not itself but it's clearly referential of it i have my own pet theories personally i think that it's the same thing we see with any non-black creator who thinks that black people are cool but can't really <laughs> oh really examine the covetous nature of their feelings or their own role in black stories covetous you are you calling him a cuck what do you mean? Is this an, are you trying to intellectually say Tarantino wishes he was black? I'm not hurt by Tarantino. In fact, Tarantino looks up to me. He wishes he was me. What is this? People who in life met a black person that they either wanted to follow, fuck, or befriend and never resolved it. And I think Tarantino is thinking about me. The equivalent of a boy pulling a little girl's pigtails, but it's a white filmmaker in black pain. So lesson two. Is that why you shaved your hair so you would no longer feel the tug of Tarantino? To make good genre, the emotion of the story and the challenges of it must be known to the author or else whatever emerges from it will be empty. Utterly false. Nope. Not true! Uh, an author can of course obliviously create a piece that has heavy impact on people. That's not true at all. That's objectively false. All flash and gore and no substance. But for the people watching today, that's rarely the problem, right? We're the people who probably said those first two things or fought for them. So with those two lessons established outside of the story, then I want to dive. 
creating genre content safely. I want to know what non-genre content is. Into the meat of it. No more premeditation. It's time to do a murder. Assuming that you are the right storyteller, that you, you're in. Who was it? God, you've infected me with. Is it Mark Twain? Is it Mark Twain I'm thinking of? That you're looking down the barrel of a narrative project you want to turn into a throat ripping genre story. You, if you want to be the throat goat, <laughs> the hired sweet baby. Um. Oh, I bet it's Oscar Wilde. Hang on. Ah! Oh, all art is at once surface and symbol. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. That doesn't quite sound like the full quote. There is more to it that matters, okay? But it is Oscar Wilde. You can find the full one for yourself if you want. We can now go back to our three pillars of genre. Identity. Jordan Peterson said that quote? No, Oscar Wilde. Or he was quoting. Do you mean Jordan Peterson quoted that? Text and tropes and power. So coming in from the outside, identity matters in the story as much as it does out. In Django Unchained, it's clear in many ways that we're not meant to identify with Django, but to watch him. The point of view character feels as though- and It's clear we're not meant to. If Tarantino put this out under a pseudonym and pretended to be black, he would not have this criticism. I guarantee it. So it's Schultz. We see this in Schultz getting the best lines. White man got the best lines! I was robbed again! The most direct and meaningful confrontations with the main villain. The best, coolest, and most meaningful death. Are you going to mention the gimmick? Best, coolest, most meaningful death. So there's meaning in this story, is there? I thought there wasn't. Curious. Um, he's the, he's the dentist. Dentist versus candy. And also the moral high ground. Because whereas Django comes to his rebellion due to his own personal suffering, Schultz gets to pontificate about right and wrong as a means to prove that he's an evolved man. And it Hey, weird. That seems like it parallels something in real life happening. Never experienced that? The call to whites to support their uh, black brothers. Uh, what form does that often take? What commentary is often made about being forced to have the struggle and other people needing to choose to take it up, do you think? Hmm, weird! Results in a movie called Django Unchained where the titular character never actually feels unleashed. He never goes off the chain. Instead, he is literally and flatly unchained by a white man named Dr. King. I'm just going to leave that one alone. Um, <laughs> it, it should be obvious why I think that was a terrible idea. <laughs> I'm on board with the idea that media should upset the right people. And it's literally you. It's literally you. It upsets you, so it's good. If I'm going to adopt your worldview, media that upsets you is good as fuck. It rules. I have a new appreciation. In this way... Tarantino fails again, I think. And we have to look to- Tarantino fails again! He's- he's failed the hurdle of my criteria. You- You lose, sir! I have over 1,000 hours editing TV tropes! A winner to learn the lesson why. Yeah, it's Blazing Saddles. So, which I want to use to illustrate the next lesson. In good genre, the identity of your characters, specifically your heroes, has to define their challenges in the narrative, but it- You're gonna have to explain that one. Also has to define their triumphs. That can mean a few things. Blazing Saddles does this by allowing Sheriff Bart's unique perspective, hard won by being exactly who he is, to save the day. And much like Django, it presents some unpleasant realities, but it subverts- That the people of this, of this town are morons? I mean, <clears throat> Do you remember the scene where Boss N-Word shows up in Django Unchained? That's a black exploitation reference. <laughs> it's black characters to come out on top in the narrative, even if they don't necessarily always come out on top in the story. Even Hang on. and allows its black characters to come out on top in the narrative, even if they don't necessarily always come out on top in the story. It's why Mel Brooks can play with a laundry list of otherwise 
offensive material, characters who say the N-word, and a clan rally in which both... Do you have the pass? Is this person black or just tanned? ...of the heroes participate, to name just a few. You said N-word, so I'm going to assume you're not black. Ah. Every genre has a history, a collection of references and narrative structures that make it what it is. That doesn't mean any film that can be described as falling into that genre contains all of that. Uh, though it can use that as a canon off of which to play and reference. And, I mean, from whence comes subversion. For instance, those expectations of recognizing it as being that genre, but then it does something that doesn't fit or is unexpected. And when I talk about the difference between narrative and story, I mean that a story can end, for example, with a character who is broke, but happy. And while we understand that in the story it's not great to be broke, we can still leave it joyously because we understand- Django claims to be a Western and a black exploitation film, but fails at both. By which you mean it's neither or it's bad at both. Through the narrative that money isn't- And what Django claims to be. By claims to be, does this person mean they got the feeling that it's telling them it wants to be, having explained genre as something you feel? What the character needed. Which brings me to texts and tropes. Because to really do genre right, you need to be able to convey both narrative and story through the tropes you're employing. The aesthetic form and the conventions of the genre you're working in. Every genre has a history and a canon. A collection of references and narrative structures that make it mm -hmm. what it is. That's why a space opera feels like a space opera. Because there are bits and pieces that resonate with our understanding of genre convention. Sure. That's very death of the author -y, though, buddy. Just saying. Django claims to be a Western and a black exploitation film, but doesn't really succeed at either. At being either, or at being a good either one? Because if it fails at both, then it means it's a different genre. Like, it fails to be it. You're gonna have to explain. Django fails to fulfill the role of a hero, or even a tortured hero, like the ones well-established, like Clint Eastwood. And... Established heroes like Clint Eastwood? Django is never fully allowed to revel in his own capacity for violence the way that you would expect of a black exploitation film. Uh, yeah, he does. There's not my memory of the film, but okay. Hey, but only after he's given permission by Schultz's heroic act. At the end of the film, we don't get either a commentary on the simplistic morality of Westerns and black exploitation or a satisfying rendering of justice. Um, it didn't tell me what to think. It, <laughs> it wasn't spelled... <laughs> the Tarantino film wasn't explicit enough for me. <laughs> the Tarantino film was too, too subtle and relied too much on subtext and allowing me to interpret. <laughs> yes, Django finds his wife, and she rides silently, I might add, by his side off into the night. But what he needed was to find his people. And at every turn... Instead, he left them in despair to fend for themselves, or shot them, or had them killed while he watched. Is this really red-pilled? Is the commentary, Django is bad because it encourages black people to be race traitors? Is that an unfair interpretation? It, it's, a, it's a lesson to the black man to betray his brothers, and to take a hoe before protecting his bros. Recognize that Tarantino isn't really delivering on the genre he claims. Are you pro-subversion or not? Genre means the story always has to be this. We can look at Blazing Saddles again. Blazing Saddles is also doing double genre duty as a Western and a comedy. And obviously, you know, it's Mel Brooks, so the comedy is on point. But what often gets ignored is that it's also a really solid Western. It features a classic love story between a lonesome cowboy and his sidekick. But where historically Yawn. the casting would have been reversed, in Blazing Saddles, Gene... Dix feels that Django's a buddy cop movie. Is Django Unchained just a reskin of Rush Hour? It also uses the trope of the ignorant townsfolk to lampoon... I feel like you can make that argument for Django, though. I think you can do it. I think you can do it. And you can say that Django Unchained is just Rush Hour, but reskinned, okay? I just need to put my finger on there's a scene that it will be really funny to parallel with Jackie Chan saying, what's up, my N-words? Never mind, it's fine. Racist. Not, and this is important, racism itself. 
but the people and mentality behind it. And although the words aren't made overt, it tells us that there's quote unquote, a new sheriff in town. And I believe that meta commentary is intentional. The new Sheriff Bart is black. And I believe it's intentional. Who cares if it's intentional or not? It's there. Dementoid trying to just decipher what the, if all you care about is deciphering what was intended, you don't need a movie. You just need to ask the director what they want to communicate. This is why David Lynch is based when he just says, no, I'm not going to answer that when people ask about meaning. So I believe Mel Brooks was saying is part of the, our future, not exclusively, but meaningfully enough to make this film still feel relevant and subversive today. And so in that way, I think it honors its genres more than a film that otherwise feels like it's doing genre cosplay. So good genre understand. Genre cosplay. Has this person recognized that it's not actually meant to be black exploitation, but referencing it? Referring to Django Unchained being like genre cosplay. You've described it as succeeding at what it's meant to do, right? Yeah, it is cos cosplaying as black exploitation. Yeah, that's the that's like the point, is it not? Stands that it earns its freedom from knowing its boundaries, and it uses its aesthetic language to honor, reference, and subvert context. Good genre understands that it earns its freedom from knowing its boundaries, and it uses its aesthetic language to honor, reference, and subvert convention. Text. Yeah, good job. Meaning can be derived from a piece's position within a canon. Yes. That's typically where all meaning in art comes from. Intro. Good job. 20 minutes to tell us that. Our key. Now the final piece, maybe the biggest failing of Django Unchained as a genre film is power. And I'll get to the lesson early because good genre must- <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Tarantino hasn't earned the right to laugh consider its relationship to power. That is true of horror, science fiction, superhero movies, and it's incredibly true of black exploitation films. And more granularly of a subgenre Didn't you say it failed to be a black exploitation film though? Genre, a cursed subgenre within black exploitation called slave exploitation, which honestly sucks to even have to say, but it is what Django and Chain both aims and claims to be. And so it nails the exploitation, providing graphic imagery, brutal violence and gore, but it fails to be about blackness or about slavery because it wants to point at the wrong thing. In a scene uh, where the KKK are shown to be a crew of bumbling idiots, we get a feeling that Tarantino is almost there and capable of some genuinely good comedy. But even in reducing such an iconic avatar of racism to a bunch of fools, we're made to feel that racism itself feels silly to Tarantino. But he hasn't earned the right to laugh. <laughs> he, Tarantino must respect the KKK. <laughs> Django Unchained is bad because Tarantino didn't show the KKK enough respect. I love it. Django Unchained treats racism and slavery as that silly little thing we did in the 19th century. Even its plantation-owning villain, Calvin Candy, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, Condi. feels custom-built to resonate rather than disgust. And I don't mean custom built to resonate. This feels like a projection of this person's view of white people. Oh, white people are going to love this. Charm. A charming, deeply racist villain is a great character because often the face of racism is charming. We should feel taken in because that is what power does. But the structural disempowerment of slavery should have been sufficient to carry the notion of upending power in the story. Everything Django does should be about allowing him to earn what Candy has so he can take him out. But he's never given that power. He's never raised to that level. Allowing him to earn what Candy has. Full of ability or importance. Instead, he waits for a white man to get there first, time and time again. Which is to say nothing of the hatred he shows for his own people at the moment that he gains power. Race traitor Django again. Power over them. A hatred that is obviously rooted in white supremacy. So the perspective 
You say all this, right? You say all this, Cameron. Do you not think this description of the character of Django reflects a kind of person in real life? Could you not take your interpretation and get meaning from it as identifying a kind of person that does exist? Do you think that exists? There are all sorts of words for these individuals. Um, and I don't think I'm allowed to say it, but you can. And you could have in this. Perhaps drop a C-bomb in your speech. Of who is the hero, where power sits in the world, and how our choices affect our power is totally blurred. And so I would argue everything about power in Django Unchained is... <laughs> Django, is Django is a dang old chungus. Yes, exactly. Wrong. In which case, what's the point? What's the point of making a film like that? And this is where some of the hardest conversations... It's cool. That's enough, sometimes. ...stations I have at my job exist. Arguably, this movie should never have existed. Because the truth is, some stories should. are... Should. Moral judgment, again. ...not yours to tell. Unless you're willing to step out of the limelight as a white person... Not yours to tell. It's n narrative, narrative realism. He went to the story mines and dug it out, and it had a label that says belongs to black people, and then he... You aren't equipped to tell a story about a black experience. But he is equipped to tell that story, right? Because he did, and that is his own story. Even a flawed story is potentially worth telling. Even you using it as an example of what's wrong means it's, it's worthy of creation, right? Is to this person art? Like, they have, there's, there's the... There's the ideal film in their mind, the correct film. And all the other films, oh well, and all film is just trying to be that film. There's just co a correct one, made by the correct people. No. However, if you are willing to put your own ego aside, well, then you can go ahead and make Blazing Saddles something great. This is the last time, I promise. But it's because what Mel Brooks did as the director was ask, what is a pain point for the Black community? What kind of films are they specifically excluded from so that America can get on with the business of telling grandiose narratives about itself? Hey, hire this person to make your game better. <laughs> oh. What would it mean if... Glazing saddles. True. White people use their privilege to do what was needed rather than what would make them feel exceptional. What do you think the dentist was doing in Django? And the answer, I think, is pretty cool stuff. We would get pretty cool stuff. But that said, just like Sheriff Bart, we don't have to wait to be given permission to seek our own liberation. So a couple of words about the road ahead before I close. Okay, and how are you liberating yourself? You're waiting to be liberated by films. You're a hypocrite. I believe we don't need to be given permission you are only made real, you only feel real by being handed a narrative. You only feel you can do that by being shown a story. You're a hypocrite. You don't believe you have the initiative to do that. You need to be shown you can do that in a story before you can do that. No. You don't believe that. You don't even believe that. You described a movie as liberating you. You were liberated by a series of pictures on a screen. As one game dev of color to another. As one game dev of color to another. The reality is that almost all of us exist and are working on problematic things with problematic people in problematic environments. And so the approach we might have to take for a while is one of harm reduction. I've talked a lot about my love of... Dog, point three is absurd. Of ...a certain Western about a black gunslinger and his dashing misanthropy. When genre is defined so much by feeling, that was one of your assertions, so that's not correct, by gut and by emotional resonance, we often know what's right, but we need to explain it to those who might not, and who might not trust us. Oh, this movie's sci-fi. Why do you say that? I'm black. That's a reasonable... <laughs> that's a reasonable exchange in this person's world. Tropic white sidekick as they give a bunch of racists the comeuppance they deserve. But the fact is, while Blazing Saddles is a triumph for me, it is an abject failure at portraying its indigenous characters. And it fails because 
Brooks made sure to interrogate his bias and privilege in relation to blackness, but he didn't offer the same respect or care to the only people we'll who can, in my opinion, truly transform Westerns as a genre. So just a note, if there are any indigenous folks who are watching this and would love to- Are you gonna apologize? Write a talk of their own- We're picking it up. But need a little help, hit me up. Wait a f wait, are you, is this person indigenous? Wait a second. Yeah, Moisten, why do they need your help? This shit needs to be led by people of the right identity. If you want to talk about this but need help, hire me. Why you? Why wouldn't they why wouldn't they go to another indigenous person who has skills? What is going on here? I'll be your Waco kid. What's the matter? Scared to be their Schultz? So while I'm coming to accept that we're not out of the woods, uh, keeping the lessons outlined in this presentation in mind has been helpful for me in staying clear on my narrative goals in genre and also advocating for them to others. Because the truth is when genre is defined so much by feeling, by gut and emotional resonance, we often know what's right. It's bizarre to say genre is incompatible with death of the author and then repeatedly say, oh, what genre something, something is is defined by the observer's gut feelings. Looking kind of like the Chudiak right now as well, by the way but we need to be able to explain it to those who might not, and those who might not trust us. I've been met with defensiveness, hostility, resentment, jealousy, and worst of all, indifference. But having a framework for my approach has been really helpful, and that's what I'm hoping to pass on. So let's review. Lesson one, good genre starts with representation on the creative team. The foundations of the project have to be solid. Ma'am, my game's about a dog that has a slingshot. It's a puzzle game about a dog that has a sir. Lesson two, to make good genre, the emotion of the story and the challenges of it must be known to the author. The emotion of the story. What a ludicrous f***ing collection of words. The emotion of the story. You, you can't inject feelings into a creation. The creation inspires them or invokes them from the viewers. The implication here is, let's say it's it's a feeling that only black people have with their history and their experiences. Therefore, to imbue a project with something that will resonate with them, the person making it has to be aware of that, otherwise you can't target it. That's not true. That's wrong. You, having had those feelings before, are actually more likely to feel them from something that doesn't accurately convey it than someone who doesn't know it, because your familiarity of, with it leads to you identifying it in, in a broader spectrum of possible things that could evoke it from you. Because it's not a new feeling to you, you are actually the person who doesn't need it to be accurate, because you're not learning it from the film, you're just having it pulled out of you again. The opposite of what this person is saying is true. Or else whatever emerges from it will be empty, all flash and gore. This is also a fantasy interpretation. This description makes it sound like this person believes in the, uh, what you call it, hypodermic needle model, where stories are basically a needle you slip under someone's skin and squirt your meaning into them with. That's not how it works at all. And no substance. That's just fantasy. Otherwise, why would you have so many people clashing over the true meaning of pieces? We've, uh, that's been revealed as utter bullshit by the existence of the internet. How many people have completely different interpretations in Clash? Lesson three, in good genre, the identity of your characters, specifically your heroes, must define their challenges in the narrative, and it must also define their triumphs. Lesson four, good genre understands that it earns its freedom from knowing its boundaries, and it uses its aesthetic language to honor, reference, and subvert convention. But Text and trope are key. Lesson five, Good genre must consider good. I think we have an example of equivocation here, where this person flickers between different meanings of good. I think here good is meaning morally good rather than of quality, of value. It's relationship to power. I think there's also a secret sixth lesson, which is don't do this alone. Make sure you have an accomplice or two to ride off into the sunset with. Good luck doing your murder. Queer consulting. Thanks for watching.
Can I have a single example of a story you've made better and how? Wait, what have you even worked on? Wait a second, did they show us what they've ever done? Credited on six games. Suicide Squad killed the Justice League!